FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and today is June 4th, 2018. Hey, first, as always, make my day. Send me an email. Nothing makes me happier in the morning than to sit back with a cup of Java, read your emails, and answer them. And we'll be reading some of them on later shows today. Uh, for your reference, email address kl at kerrylutz.com. Market volatility. April was pretty, uh, pretty crazy. It looked like it became another question of uh, sell in May and go away, perhaps. Volatility really going cratering. Interest rates up over 3% on the 10 year, back below it, finished out at around 283 or 87, if memory serves me correct. Where is it all heading? Well, David Scranton's with us right now. David, you're head of Sound Income Strategies, and you've been with us many a time. Welcome back. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, it's been a little crazy. It's been a little crazy. You know, we saw, you mentioned the 10-year treasury. You know, we saw the 10-year treasury just about a month ago as low as in the low 2.7 range and jumped up to 3.1 jump back down below 2.85. And now as of this morning, it's actually just a tiny, tiny bit over 2.9 again. Uh, a little crazy in light of what's going on with Italy and some other things around the globe. Yeah. Well, uh, Europe looks like none of the problems really ever got solved, David. And now we're back to where we were a few years ago. The Euro is plunging against the dollar. It was up to 123 or so. Now it's back, uh, last I looked, and I should look again very shortly, it was around 117 and change. And that's a pretty dramatic fall in the past month for what what looked like all their problems, all it was happy days are here again in Europe. And all of a sudden, uh uh-uh, not the case. Yeah, right now it's right at 1.169. So 116.9. And uh, that's that's not like an overly, uh, you know, optimistic endorsement of the euro. No. And, you know, we had this global financial crisis and some people forget it's global, but it was global. And, you know, we put some measures in place. But at the end of the day, we really didn't solve a lot of the problems. But. You know, that was at a time when the economy was doing terribly. So an improving economy, I wouldn't say booming, but an improving economy helps cover up a lot of evils. And central bank intervention helps cover up a lot of evils, too. And, you know, even though we are now trying to reverse the effects of all that central bank intervention through the reversal of all that fun stuff that we that's come to be known as quantitative easing, uh, in Europe, there's still a lot of easing going on. Um, And it'd be interesting to see now whether or not they continue easing longer or increase the amount of uh, financial easing that they actually do uh, in light of this change in the euro and in light of what's going on with Italy. It'll be interesting to see. Yeah, it's Italy. It wouldn't surprise me to see Greece come back into the news as well. It looked like the problem in Greece was solved, but nonetheless, they're in a depression and they've got a lot of problems in Greece. And... Again, nothing has been done to change the fundamental issues and challenges of the euro. Hey, look what's happening in Italy. The government that was elected there, look, they tried to stop it. Now it's a populist Eurosceptic government, and that puts additional pressure on the cracks in the alliance. Of course. And, you know, that was a big experiment. Uh, you know, the euro was a, an unprecedented experiment. You have different countries uh, with different economic agendas and, and, and other agendas, political agendas, et cetera, and you try to get them together on the same currency on the same page. It's a lot harder than you think. And, you know, whenever you have an experiment, it's like a big laboratory experiment. You know, hey, sometimes you mix chemicals together and you get a good outcome. Sometimes you mix chemicals together and you get an explosion. And only time is going to tell what's really going to happen with the euro. But you're right, the, the, the cracks seem to be getting bigger uh, east of the Atlantic. 
Yeah, the fishers are just like the big fishers on the big island of Hawaii. The fishers coming from the volcano, right? And the lava sure. flow. And it's nothing less than a volcano. What's going on in Italy there? Uh, totally outside the establishment, out, outside the norm, political uh, movement going on there. Yep, 100%. It's, it's true. And, and what's interesting, though, is we talk about these experiments and, you know, what's the outcome of the experiment? Well, that's exactly what we're doing right now in our country when we're trying to re reverse all that quantitative easing, when we're trying to take all that printed money that we just printed and, you know, we use it to buy bonds back from the public to drive down our long-term interest rates. We stopped that about three years ago. And now we're trying to get that money, uh, in essence, back, that printed money, by selling those bonds back to the public. That's, you know, of course, how the government's trying to raise long-term interest rates. You know, but I ask you, despite all the power of the government and the Federal Reserve, how can they be successful when, right now, a 10-year Italian bond – which arguably has more default risk than ours, although a lot, what many would argue that, that ours isn't in the best shape, uh, but arguably has more default risk than ours. A 10-year Italian government bond as of today is actually paying about a third of a percent less interest than ours, a mm -hmm. third of a percent less with more risk. You know, so I ask you, how successful can the Federal Reserve be pushing up our interest rates when we're in a global market and we have these rates in Europe with countries that are less stable than ours, but the rates are lower than ours? It doesn't make sense. Ultimately, there's, there's ultimately some European investors, even domestic investors investing in Europe are going to say, wait a minute, you tell me I can get more yield on a U.S. bond with less risk? Okay, let me buy that. And that is going to be a significant headwind to against the Federal Reserve's efforts to drive up long-term interest rates. And that's another huge experiment. And we'll see what happens. Yes, we will see what happens, all right. And a lot of challenges ahead. Look, uh, the stock market's been going up. I mean, arguably, it's still in a bull market until we see otherwise. It's, it's uh, almost 10 years here. And sure. how much how much longer can that go on for? Well, I think we're we were in what's called the blow off period of a bull market where it's more emotional, um, and that hasn't. We don't know whether that's stopped yet or not. We had a pullback right on Groundhog Day, so it's about four months now of a pullback. Uh, we've had a couple pullbacks, and we keep approaching the previous high from the end of January, but we haven't broken through it. And remember that rising interest rates are bad for the stock market, um, as they're bad for many financial markets. You know, banks love higher interest rates, but pretty much no one else does. Um, and I think the, the markets are seeing some weakness from that right now. So even though we're getting good economic data, that's better than we've seen in nine years. I mean, not stellar, but still better. Um, the markets aren't reacting to it because they've gone up so much and, you know, because of what's happening with interest rates and risks around the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this, this could, you know, this tends to happen. Like I, you remember back to 2000, Carrie, you remember yeah. uh, back to 2007 when the markets mm -hmm. peaked and then they started to drop, you know, there was a lot of this for a few months afterward, there's this thing where it, it drops off its peak and then it starts to get up near the peak and tries to test the new high. And then it comes down, it goes back up again. And it's kind of in this trading range for a while where it's just waiting for some news, either really, really, really good news. That's going to make it break through on the upside or really bad news that really starts a more permanent slide, a bear market. And, you know, time will tell, of course, which of, that, which of those two scenarios are going to pan out this time. But I've got to think right now there's probably potential for more bad news than good news to break out of that trading range. Yeah, well, it, what's interesting is how resilient the market has been, though, David, how it's kept up nonetheless mm -hmm. and really, really been quite strong in the face of like what's really would appear to be bad news or certainly news that wasn't positive for the market and yet it's kept going and that's why it's so incredibly hard at a time like this when 
you know, you start, it looks like things, you know, people say, well, you, you, shouldn't people have known we were going to have a major drop? You know, 2000, the tech bubble, people should have known. 2007, the writing had been on the wall with the financial crisis since March of that year. People should have known. But the problem is when the market's not dropping, is not reacting, and all the talking heads on TV are saying, hey, the economic data still looks pretty good. You know, two things happen with an individual psyche. I mean, number one, the tendency to bury one's head in the sand and say, hey, I think things are going to be fine. Okay. Um, and number two, some, the tendency for somebody to grasp on to that positive news, because most of us are pretty optimistic and we want to believe that that good news is really going to pan out. So when we turn on TV and we hear the talking heads, we think, oh, well, maybe there's nothing to worry about. We're good. And see, the problem right now is when you look in the rearview mirror, 10 years goes back a long ways. And unfortunately, the rearview mirror for the stock market doesn't come with one of those warnings like you get on the side mirror of a truck where it says objects may be closer than they appear. <laughs> so people are looking in the market side view mirror and they're saying, well, I can't see anything but an upward trending market because they can't see 10 years back in their mind's eye. Um, I wish the market did come with such a warning like the truck, but it, unfortunately it doesn't. No, it certainly does not. And that's why you... You got to try to somewhat anticipate the market. I mean, not be 100% invested, have cash. What do you do here? Well, at a, at a time like this, I mean, first of all, forget about a time like this. It's always most important to be in things that are appropriate for your goals. Okay, so, so first of all, I tell people that you have to figure out this, whatever pool of money you're investing, is this money you're investing for a lump sum purchase or is this money you're investing for future income? Mm -hmm. If it's a lump sum purchase, then you need to be balanced. At a point like this, you've got to have some cons more conservative equities. I know it's an oxymoron, but as conservative as you can be. And then you've got to have a big chunk of it in bonds and bond-like instruments that are a little more secure, and maybe some in cash, because everything is a little high right now. So if you're looking to create a lump sum purchase down the road with this investment by selling it and buying something, uh, home, vacation home, whatever, then you've just got to be diverse and conservative and wait for the markets to give you a sign. Right? But if you're investing this for retirement income, and if you're w retired or w within 10 years of retirement, different story. I think this is definitely a time you need to focus on income instead of growth. You know, people, Carrie, people forget that total return has two components to it. It's a, it's a it's a sum of income that gets generated from investments, interest, and dividends, as well as growth for capital appreciation. And people lose sight of it. You know, people always say to me, well, I need growth on my money. I need my money to grow. And I say, well, okay, so you mean if I had a 10% FDIC insured, to give, uh, insured CD to give you, you're trying to tell me you wouldn't want to put any money in it? And I'd say, well, of course. And I'll respond by saying, well, do you realize you don't get any growth in a CD? It's all interest. <laughs> and then people realize that when they say they need more growth, what they really mean is return, total mm -hmm. return. Yes. And then when they realize that they can get total return by any combination of growth and income they want, they're not tied to growth, it becomes liberating. Uh, and oftentimes I share with people that a lot of income investors since the turn of the century actually earned more in their portfolios than growth investors. And then the light bulb goes off and they realize, wait a minute, I mean, I might not have to sacrifice total return if I go from the G, the growth, to the I, the income. That's right. And that is especially valuable for people who are retired or within 10 years of retirement and plan to use this pool of money to generate income in the future. Because, you know, everybody says that income generating investments are dangerous in a rising interest rate environment. And yes, the textbook does say that, and that has some truth. But again, the Federal Reserve is really going to have a tough time pushing interest rates up too, too high in the light of what's going on abroad and every, all the things we talked about today. So sure. invest based upon your goals and what matters to you. And if you're aggressive, kick it down a couple notches. If you're conservative, then I think it's time to be even a step more conservative. Yeah, that's interesting that you say that. And also, if you're, if you're not going out too far and you're, you're worried, if you're worried about interest rates going higher and you don't go out too far, that will somewhat mitigate the risk, won't it? Of course. Of course. And right now, you don't really get rewarded for going out too far. I mean, you go from a 10-year bond to a 30-year bond, and you pick up very little return. Mm -hmm. um, so there's not a lot of reason to go out too, too far. Right. So stay, stay close by. And are there any 
deals out there where you, you know you used to be able to find banks that maybe were not doing that great, but FDIC insured that would pay you a point, a hundred basis points or hundred fifty basis points more. Uh, you know, kind of attracting hot money. Is that uh, is that viable that uh, option now, or do you just want to stay away? Well. As far as investing in CDs and banks and things like that, sure, it always makes sense to shop CDs. As if it's FDIC insured, at least in theory, you shouldn't have to worry about it. Although remember that you know if you need your money and a bank fails or the FDIC takes them over, you'll get it back, but you may not get it back when you want it. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to be shopping CD rates, you have to make sure that it's money. If you're going to go to a, a maybe a lower rated bank that that is, is, is buying business with a higher interest rate, you know, you just got to make sure it's money that you, you don't need to put your finger on right away. Yeah. Um, but that's a great strategy for your short term money. And like I said, if your goal down the road is a lump sum goal instead of an income goal with this pool of money, then you need to have some money in maybe conservative equities. You have some money in bonds and bond like instruments and yeah, have some money in just cash and cash like instruments. And if you can get a little better rate by shopping, absolutely do it. Right. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And everything you say makes a lot of sense, uh, David. So uh, we want to find more out about you, contact you. Where do we go? Uh, you can go to uh, soundincomestrategies.com, our company's website, or uh, go to my book website, uh, returnonprincipal.com. And uh, principal ends in P L E. No, I didn't spell it wrong. <laughs> Return on principal.com. <laughs> hey, and uh, that's a great point and a great title for the book. Hope it's selling well. We will talk to you again real soon. And again, uh, questions, comments, et cetera, just come over and uh, check out financialsurvivalnetwork.com and send us an email, kl at kerrylutz.com, Twitter feed at kerrylutz. And the Facebook page is Financial Survival Network. David, we'll talk to you again real soon. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Carrie. It's been great. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.